you know, you get up here watching the video and thinking, I'm forgetting something. Oh yeah, just a microphone. Which is fine for you guys. I'm plenty loud, but the people online can't hear. They would also say would, it would be like this. So, I used to get sound guys mad because I learned how to do this where you could act like your mic is cutting and it drives them crazy and they want to turn your mic off. Sorry, Randy. I've got a serious ring up here. You probably are aware of that. Ooh. They hate when you do that too. Ooh. We're finding the resonance in the room. Ooh, it's right there. Uh, I think there's an open mic somewhere that's not mine. That would be my guess. Boo, boo. Very ADD today. <laughs> Every day. All days. Up, oh, much better. That was it. You found it. I heard it. Today we're starting our new series on Revelation. No, no, no S. If you say it with an S to a, to a seminarian, that's like saying library. Don't say library, and the word about people who sell houses, I always say wrong, it's realtor, not realtor. Realtors will correct you, realtors will correct you if you say realtor, and librarians will connect you if you say library, and pastors will correct you if you say revelation, no S, so drop the S. So what does revelation mean? I'm going to show you. With this towel, it's very exciting. When I used to teach school, I used to teach Danielle. She remembers me doing this, which shows you how awesome it was. So I'm going to show you how awesome it is. <clears throat> Watch this. But you have to have music anytime you're going to do magic in church. Sorry. There's illusion. Illusion. We're not allowed to call it magic, right? So illusion in church. So we'd go. <clears throat> da 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 you're supposed to clap. That's it. My favorite one years ago was to do this one. And by the way, I learned these from my roommate Richard, who is a still a youth pastor at 56 years old. He is this tall and this wide. And I know what happens. The pastor says, hey, you might want to be something other than a youth pastor. And he says, no. And the pastor goes, yeah, whatever you want. <laughs> but, uh, but Richard also taught me this one, which I used to teach my class, which goes like this. Right? Yeah, there you go. So, yes. Yes, we demand clapping, which is weird. But, but what's funny is I did that for my junior high class. <laughs> I'll never forget. A kid's trying to show his friend. He's like, Mr. B just did this. They used to call me Mr. B because they can't say the word Brookins, apparently. So they would go, watch this, watch this. And they would do the song. How did he do that? I don't know. Anyway, he had to be there. It was a very junior high thing. So anyway, so let me tell you what revelation means from that whole thing. And, and by the way, the other word for revelation is apocalypse. Doesn't that sound scary? Like apocalypse. Let me tell you what it means. It means, ta-da! It means reveal. It means revealing. It means to reveal something. It's not this scary word. Now, I love apocalyptic movies. As long as the dog doesn't die, I'm good. I'm good. Kristen's like, but you watched that movie and everybody died. I'm like, yeah, but the dog lived. So we're good, right? <laughs> And, and so, you know, she knows that I like all these weird movies that have come out, 2012, a few years ago, and uh, the end of the world movies, and, you know, at the end they say, everybody's dead, but look how clean the air is. And I'm like, that is the weirdest ending to a movie. There literally was a movie, that was the ending. The ending was them looking down from the space station going, yeah, but look how clean the air is, which is, you would never... Hopefully, you would never say anything so dumb, but it's just these hilarious movies, and, but I love all of that, and, and I'm sorry, it started with all the explosions, I, and my dad used to take us to stock car races back when we thought the best part was when they wrecked, and now you're not allowed to say that, right, aren't you? But, but I remember that as a kid, we would go up there, and so today as we talk about this idea of revelation, I want to encourage you, we're going to talk about some key truths 
from the throne of God. That's going to be our topic today, key truths from the throne of God. And we're going to look in Revelation chapter 1, and we're going to just do the beginning of chapter 1, and then I'm going to bring in a few supporting texts. But I want to tell you something about this book, okay? First of all, there's two big extremes to the book of Revelation. The first one is, let's just ignore it altogether. I don't understand it. This is a weird book. What are all these locusts? What's happening? Uh, you know. And then the other extreme is trying to figure all this stuff out and making a chart that looks like something from a beautiful mind. It's just, you know, arrows and this is what's going to happen. And literally, can I tell you a secret? Every generation has named who Satan is in the earth. It's whoever you don't like. And so it could be a politician. It could be back in World War II, it was Hitler. Uh, back in World War I, it was uh, somebody else uh, who, if you know history, you know who it was. I have no idea. Uh, uh, back in the Civil War, of course, they talked about this is Armageddon. And, you know, back and back. And then Israel was born. Okay, so this is what's happening now. And let me tell you a big secret, okay? Just so you'll know it ahead of time. Number one, we don't know. I don't care how smart the guy is, and he wants to send you to send him money. Now, here's the biggest danger I will tell you. The book of Revelation, and I'm going to show you very soon, was not written for you to be freaked out. And people, remember what the news, remember the news has two main purposes to get you to watch. Do you remember what they are? I've told you over and over, I'm going to tell you again. Fear and anger. So the news is going to try to make you afraid or angry. Why? Because you'll watch commercials. They don't care about you. I know you feel like your favorite news host who reads you the news from a teleprompter thinks you're the best thing since sliced bread. They don't care. They go home. They probably don't even believe what they just read. They just pretend so that you believe and you feel angry or afraid. Why? Because you just watched another commercial. That's what they care about. And the truth is, there's a lot of people teaching on Revelation, and the reason that they go into all this, it's AI. This is the newest one, by the way. I googled, like a doofus, Revelation this week just to see what people were teaching, and I was like, oh, not really. AI is the newest thing, so that is the mark of the beast, right? So whatever it is, credit cards when they came out, uh, uh, checks. By the way, when they first started writing checks in church, people said that was the mark of the beast because you should give cash in church and not checks. Did you know that? Did you know that? Well, you don't even want to believe about the, when the organ first came into church. That's another one for another day. But here's what I want you to know about Revelation. Here's what you need to know. In any movie that you've watched, once you watch it once, you already know who wins. And so let me tell you a secret. God wins. So the big picture, the big picture of all this stuff is God wins. So what are you worried about? I mean, it's like watching a, a, a reviewed basketball game that you already know the Orlando Magic won. The Orlando Magic are in a seventh game playoff game today. We don't know who wins yet, but if you record it and later you watch it and one of your friends calls you and says, wasn't it awesome that the Magic won? Oh. You're not going to be in the middle of the game freaked out because the magic are losing. Because you know who wins. So regardless, listen, you're not in heaven yet. So regardless of what's going on in your life, regardless of what the, the news and your friends and the articles you're reading are trying to convince you to be afraid of or angry about, you ready, ready? God wins. And so you don't have to get all invested in this world that's only our temporary home anyway and so freaked out about what might happen. And might it happen? Yeah. Why? Because God wins. And so today you can live in freedom and not in fear because we know that God wins. Today I'm going to give you three things, and I hope every week to give you something practical from the book of Revelation. That's one thing most people don't do. Uh, when you read the book of Revelation, they basically tell you a bunch of stuff that you can't do anything about. And they'll tell you, you know, they'll name some leader today usually and tell you that's who this is in the book of Revelation because they haven't been doing that for the last 200 years. 
right? And so, and so the truth is, these guys make this stuff up. Why? Because they get you to send them money. I'm sorry, but that's part of the deal for some of these guys. And so, uh, by the way, I've watched some of these videos. <laughs> they are nuts. If you want to have some fun today, watch some of them. It really is like watching a movie. But anyway, so today we're going to talk about this idea of being blessed. Why? Number one, Jesus is the focus, the focus of Revelation. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, attentive hearts, and then we're going to talk about freedom through Christ. So let's look at number one. Jesus is the focus. If you have your Bible, turn to Revelation no, chapter 1, and we're going to look just at verse 1 and 2, and here we go. The revelation, remember, revelation means, ta-da, it's an unveiling. There it is, okay? The revelation, who's it from? From Jesus Christ. So where's the focus right at the beginning? For Jesus, which God gave him to show his servants, that's us, what must soon take place. So John is writing down thousands of years ago, this is going to take place soon. Can I tell you something about God that you and I don't realize? His timetable is very different than ours. Have you figured that out yet? God is never late and seldom early. <laughs> And so, you know, on our timeline, sometimes we're like, okay, God, I'd like an answer for this. And he's like, tomorrow. Oh, yeah, by the way, it says in the word that day is like a thousand years to God. It's like, really? And so he says soon, and then it continues. He made known, why? By sending his angel to his servant, John. Now, who's this dude, John? This is Jesus' disciple. You can read the book of John. This is, he is put on this island of Patmos. He's basically sent to Gilligan's Island as his punishment. He, uh, at this time, is the only disciple left. He's an old man. He's seen life. Supposedly, at the end of his life, over and over, he would tell people, love one another. When John describes himself in the book of John, I love it, because instead of calling himself John, he says, you know, the disciple Jesus loved. You know, the disciple Jesus loved. And now he doesn't do that in the book of Revelation, but it's awesome because we're going to look back at a couple of passages from the book of John and show you uh, uh, kind of the comparison. You ever play with a magnifying glass to light leaves on fire or grass? Anybody do that? Oh, come on, Rodney. I know you've done. Okay, there you go. Okay, so... So here's the thing. If you've ever done that, right, you have to learn. It's kind of a skill, and you and you got the sun. In Florida, it was a lot easier than other places, but but uh, I can remember doing this down in Miami, and we'd have some little leaves or some grass, you know, and you'd gather it together, and then you'd take the magnifying glass, and then what do you do? You kind of pull it in and out. What are you trying to do? You're trying to focus the light on that one area, and then what happens? Poof, right? But you learn. You learn. You have to focus. You have to get things right. And here's the thing about life when it comes to Jesus. John starts out by saying, it's about Jesus. Jesus is the one who brings this. Jesus is the one that feeds into our lives. Jesus is the one who does this. And the truth is, we live in a world that's always, listen, always trying to distract us from Christ. Always. The focus should not be on your pastor. The focus should not even just be Scripture, although Scripture all points to Jesus. So if you read Scripture the right way, it's always going to point to Christ. But the focus really is Christ, and yet what do we do? We worry. We fear. We get frustrated. We get aggravated. We drive on I-95, right? All, did I say that last one? I meant to keep that one off the... Right? We, we, get, we get frustrated about something. We, we, somebody gets something, and it's unfair. We have a situation happen, and we think, well, why am I dealing with this? And we start focusing on all these other things. And instead of saying, Jesus, I need you in my life, we begin doing all kinds of other things. I talked to the kids just a little bit about John 10, but let me read the whole passage to you. John 10, verse 9 through 11. I am the gate, Jesus says. So John, early on, disciple of Jesus, the one that Jesus loved, is saying words from Jesus. And he says, I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Jesus doesn't say there's many paths to God. Jesus doesn't say it doesn't matter who you go through. Jesus doesn't say there's a lot of other ways and other people on earth. And there's all... By the way, if Jesus was a prophet... And he said this, saying there were other prophets or other ways to heaven. He's a liar, and then he's a false prophet. And so Jesus is talking about himself, and he says, I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Now, if he wasn't who he said he was, he's crazy, or he's very arrogant. 
but he's God. We're going to discover that in a minute. They will come and go out and find pasture. And don't you love that? I get to drive here through cow fields, not through cow fields, hopefully not through cow fields, but I get to drive past cow fields. I did hit a deer a few weeks ago, so we did go into the field, but I drive past cow. And I'll tell you, there's times you go by and there's one field especially that I love to pull over. There's a big field. There's some oak trees in that field. There's usually some paint horses. I think they're called paints. They have multicolors. Last night I saw a black cow with a white tail. That was cool. I saw this white thing swinging around. I said, what is it's his tail? And my mom laughed. I didn't know such a thing existed. When my mom was in school, she learned all the different cows. She really did. That was on a test. What kind of cow is this? I've never had that on a test. I'm like, that cow has a white tail. So there's cows and there's horses and a little farmhouse. And this one field has a, a little windmill or whatever you call it on the property. too. It's just beautiful. And it's amazing sometimes just to pull over and take a breath and go, wow. Jesus could have described our relationship with him in any way. He could have said, get down on your knees and worship. But what does he say? He says, I'm going to take you to pasture. I'm going to help you to find rest, he says in another place. There's all these different verses about how, what's he doing? He's taking you somewhere where you will be fed, where you will be fulfilled. And so here's the question, are you? Are you living life in light of the focus of Christ? Or are you distracted by all the things around you? Are you taking time to enjoy the pasture that he's given you? Or are you freaked out? And then it continues. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And then Jesus says, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And we're going to get into that imagery later in the book of Revelation. But John understood who Jesus was. And even in the book of John and then in the book of Revelation, he's saying Jesus is God. He is making it clear that he is God. It's three in one. He talks about I and the Father are one. And he says here, what is the description that Jesus gives about himself. I'm going to lead you to pasture. I'm the gate. You, you can find God through me. I'm the way. Not only that, I'm going to lay down my life for the sheep. Let me give you a practical way to think about this. The next time you're focused on worry, which we all do, right? You ever been so distracted that you focused on whatever you're worried about or frustrated about? You ever been so angry about something that you have a hard time letting it go? You ever afraid? Next time that happens, I want you just to take a moment. You can take a deep breath if you want to. Sometimes that helps us to refocus. It has nothing to do with scripture. Sometimes it has to do with we haven't been breathing. <laughs> So take a moment, take a breath, and then say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for taking care of me. Thank you for feeding me. Thank you for looking out for me. Because the truth is, sometimes we get focused on everything else, and we wonder why we're so freaked out and feel so unstable and unsettled. It's because instead of focusing on what Jesus is doing, we're focusing on everything else. Number two. We are blessed by attentive hearts. My poor mom. You, every time you see my mom, my mom was here in church last night. Every time you see my mom, you should say, oh, bless you. She had five children. Two of us are pastors, which, by the way, that's the opposite of what you think is good, right? There's a reason you become pastors. It has to do with your childhood, right? But we would be sitting at the table, so we would have dinner and be sitting at the table, and I would be taught, my mom would say, how was your day? So I would start telling her, and halfway through, I could tell she was not listening at all. 
Now, my sister Kelly was next to me, my older sister, and my sister Kelly has always thought I was funny. I love when she comes to church because like adding a uh, laugh track to church because she'll just laugh at anything. She would be laughing right now just for me saying that. And so the truth is she would be sitting there and I would all of a sudden say to my mom, I would realize she wasn't listening and I'd say, and mom, then I hit the teacher in the face. And mom would go, "Uh uh-huh. And I'd go, and then I ran out of the school. Uh Uh-huh. And then I did this, and I would start saying just crazy stuff, and my mom would go, uh-huh, 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 and my sister Kelly would all of a sudden go, ha-ha, and start laughing so hard that my mom would say, what? And Kelly would say, mom, you were saying uh-huh, but you weren't paying any attention to what he said. Can I tell you a secret about reading scripture? You ever read the Bible and have no idea what you just read? Let me just say this one. You ever walk into a room and forgot why you walked in there, right? Everybody understood that one. Okay, so the truth is we read the Bible like we walk into a room so often. We we think we're reading it. We think we're paying attention. But the truth is if somebody said, what did I just say? We would go, oh. I had that happen in college. I was actually talking to a friend next to me. The teacher had decided she was going to be creative, and she set up our tables in a semicircle, which is never good for me. So I was talking, literally talking to the person next to me while the teacher is here, and it was a teaching class. So the teacher wanted to make an example of me, and she said, Eric, what did I just say? I literally looked at her, repeated the last sentence she said, and went back to talking like a jerk. She was shocked. Can I tell you something, though? I said what she said because I heard it, but I had no idea what I even said back to her. I did not have ears to hear. You know, Jesus would say that all the time. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And everybody who was there was like, that makes no sense. But to us, it does. Because the truth is, you can be listening, you can hear things and have no idea what somebody just said. Husbands, you all understand this fully, right? All right, so here we go. Revelation 1, verse 3, and I want to read the first word, and I want to go off on a tangent for just a second. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Time out. Now, this is why I can say that people who teach this book in order to incite Fear in you and panic in you and freak you out are teaching it wrong. Why can I say that? Because this blessed word means happy. It means you should read this and be happy. So when somebody is freaking you out and telling you that helicopters are in this passage or whatever other stuff they've made up over the years, credit cards, and I mean, every new technology they just throw in there and you're supposed to be afraid to be around it. And the truth is, you're supposed to be blessed. Blessed means happy. Happy is he who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And then it says, and happy or blessed are those who hear it and do what? Take to heart what is written in it. Why? Because the time is near 2,000 years ago and today. Why? It's closer today than it was yesterday. When's Jesus coming back? A day sooner. I heard a song recently. He said, I'm one day older. I'm one day closer to not dying young. I love that. I love that idea, right? We're, we're all one day closer to heaven. We're all one day closer to seeing Jesus face to face. How close are we? One day closer. John to the seven churches, that's God's perfect number, in the province of Asia, Asia, and then he says grace, that's the word charis, I love that word, I don't have time to go into that one today, and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come. What's he talking about? God, his, was, his to come. And from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus, whose faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. What's really interesting is you look at all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John does not ever quote Jesus saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And yet one of the first things he says in the book of Revelation is, blessed are those who read this and listen with their heart. 
And you know the difference between listening in your heart and not. Do I have to explain that one to you? So listen to this next passage. John says uh, earlier in his book of the Bible, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat, he's quoting Jesus, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. So what's Jesus saying? He's saying you can't just live for yourself. You can't make everything about you. Let me tell you something about listening to your heart when you read the Bible. You can't be selfish and self-centered. Let me give you a practical thing. When you go to God in prayer, if you're going to spend time in the Word, the first thing you ought to say is, God, I empty myself. I surrender to you. Lord, help me to read this word in light of who you are, in light of the Holy Spirit. Not because I'm good enough or great enough or have it together enough or I'm smart enough or I'm better than anybody else. God, you know I have nothing and I come to you, I pour all of me out and I surrender to you. I just saw two really cute girls run across our parking lot with pink dresses on. It was just the, I wish I had a video camera for you guys, sorry. I want you to say, God, would you give me a listening heart? When you're on the way to church on Sundays, I want you to begin to pray. God, give me a listening heart. Lord, even if the pastor's terrible, help me to hear what you want to say to me. By the way, I've prayed that exact prayer. I mean, not just listening to other people, but listening to myself. Lord, would you use your word in me? I love this. He who counts the stars and calls them each by name is in no danger of forgetting his own children. You ever feel useless? You ever feel God doesn't care? The truth is he's named all the stars. He notices you. He knows you by name. Number three, not only is Jesus the focus, not are we blessed by a tent of ears, we have freedom through Christ. When I was a kid, sometimes my mom would say to me these words, you wait till your father gets home. Can I tell you that that was not a day I was excited about dad coming home? And the truth is, if a non-believer, if somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ reads Revelation, it feels like you wait till your father gets home. But here's the deal. If you're a Christian, it should not be that day for you. Here's what it should be like for you. My dad used to go down to Homestead to work sometimes. And on the way home, he would go to a payphone. Do you remember payphones? He would go to a payphone and he would call my mom and say, I'm bringing home barbecue. Now, you need to understand, we had a place called Flynn's Barbecue on the way home to our house, which was awesome, down in Miami, down in Kendall. And he would pull in and he would order the family platter. And the family platter was huge. It was like this big, a big circular thing. In the middle was a pile of giant onion rings, French fries. I'm doing good so far, right? Chicken. Eh, who cares about chicken? Pork barbecue, beef barbecue, corn on the cob, beans, and ribs. I knew there was something else. And ribs, just in a huge circle. And mom would say, dad's coming home with Flynn's barbecue. To this day, me talking about Flynn's barbecue just now made my mouth water. That was a very different feeling than I had the days mom said, wait till your father gets home. This was, wait till your father gets home. And the truth is, as a Christian, when you read the book of Revelation, it should be a Flynn's moment, preparing for the best and not worried about anything else. Because why? Because dad's coming home with good news for you. Listen to what it says. To him who loves us and has freed us by, by our sins, by his blood. And listen, he's made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. 
What's he pointing out? He's pointing that God has given you the power to be a priest. There is no more curtain. There is no more separation. You can go to God. Why? With the escort of Christ. Why? Because he's washed you with his blood. And then it says, look, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him and those who pierce them. And those people get the dad's coming home. And all the peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. And then he says, Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega. That means beginning and end. Says the Lord God, who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. He is coming. That's good news for us. And just like you can already, some of you are like, we've got to get barbecue for lunch. Honey, we're going to get barbecue for lunch. we we got to get, did you hear him talk about barbecue? Now I want barbecue, right? Just like you're excited, that's called hope. When your mouth starts watering, that's called hope. And that's the excitement we should have about Jesus returning as Christians. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have, listen, confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart full of assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly, listen to this, to the hope. Oh, onion ring. <laughs> to the hope we profess. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. So you don't have to fear eternity. You don't even have to fear what's next. We're going to talk a little bit as we go through Revelation about what is coming. But the truth is, as Christians, we are blessed. Why? Because our hope is not in us and in our goodness. It's in Jesus. And he's coming home with dinner for us. And so we hope in him. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ and you want to surrender to him today, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to be a Christian. The fact that Jesus died because we're all messed up, broken sinners. We never have it together, but we surrender it to him and he gives us his holiness. And his right to be part of the kingdom of God. So if you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you after the service about becoming a Christian. Maybe you're here today and as a Christian, you've been afraid of a lot of things. Hey, it's time to exchange fear for hope. It's time to recognize that God wins. And quit going through life worried about everything because we know who wins. Would you join me as we close in prayer? Father, thank you for this time today. Thank you for your word. I thank you for the book of Revelation. I pray that, Father, we would live with hope, with joy, knowing that you're going to take care of us, that you're walking with us, that, Father, you're coming home, but it's going to be the best reunion we've ever had. Lord, I pray for each one that we would live in this hope knowing that you win. Thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen.